Okay. Where's Laura? Good evening, good afternoon, whatever time it is. I'm so blessed to be here with you. And so in the joy of what we're doing here, and I would love to talk to you today uh, about children. Children are a big part of my life, having three of my own. Children are a big part of the consciousness that I want to talk about today because I really believe that they are where we are trying to go. They already are there. Uh, I would like to talk to you today about how I got my talk title because there's a real, real trust involved with that. Um, I was coming back from the convention in Orlando, which was so well organized and just so amazing. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, coming back, I was at the airport, I was at Hudson News, and I was buying a bottle of water, and as I bought the bottle of water, I was thinking about my talk title. What is my talk title? I know what I want to say, I don't know what to call it. So something told me to look past the, the, the cashier at the counter, and I saw exactly what I wanted my talk title to be, and this is what I saw. A box of good and plenty. And I'm like, good and plenty, good and plenty consciousness. That's what I'm going to talk about. And not only good and plenty, but there's plenty of good. I think it's a home run when you can switch the words and they still mean something powerful together. So my talk title is Good and Plenty Consciousness. And I'm going to start and end with children because uh, they got it going on there. So. I recently, as of last week, stepped down from being the youth and family director at my center. And that was my position for nine years. So a lot of joy went into that, a lot of um, excitement, a lot of passion, a lot of growing. Uh, so, so much, so much love went into that. And uh, it continues because my, my center is my center, um, but it's kind of a wonderful thing to pass the baton to somebody else who loves children the way that I do. And to have an opening to fill with other things that I am stepping into. So, uh, and stepping down from Youth and Family Director was a powerful decision for me and, and uh, wow. It's just uh, amazing because my car just goes to the little house on Sunday that I need to be at, and then I'm like, oh, I don't even have to be there tomorrow. What a strange feeling that is. I get to choose to sleep in or to, or to do other things. I can be in the sanctuary. Wow. Um, so, but the kids, when they go by, when they go on stage, when they do their messages, when the leaders do their messages, um, I will embrace them with, with so much love because that is such an amazing place where, where my heart resonates with theirs and it always will. <sighs> a couple of the kids I'd love to tell you about, if I may. Um, we had this little boy named Anthony who sticks out as one of the um, most precious of stars in my career as youth and family director. And one day we were sitting in circle time and um, I was asking the children, you know, ranged in age from four to eight, where's God? To you, where's God? And Anthony, a little background on Anthony, Anthony was a four-year-old adorable little boy with big brown eyes. And he was raised, being raised by his great grandparents. Not his, parent, gran not his parents, not his grandparents, his great grandparents. And they were quite elderly and quite slow moving. And he was quite energetic and, and wow. Uh, so there was a lot of compassion that circled that family right off the bat. And Anthony, when asked, and he, he came to church every Sunday in this beautifully ironed, buttoned down, collared shirt. And this little boy was just so precious and so proud. And uh, this one particular morning when he was asked where God was, Anthony raised his hand and he said, oh, God is in my pocket. And you are so right about that. You are absolutely right about that. God is in your pocket and you have it with you all the time, don't you? And he said, yes, it was just so cute. So I always think about that. You know, God is in all of our pocket. It's an invisible pocket. But it's a pocket. That means it's always right here, always right here to, 
to bring out and to know that that's inside of us. And he knew that. He knew that. He didn't have to be led there. He knew it. It's just where he lives in his own mind. <sighs> Another little boy I'd like to tell you about, his name is Jonah. And his mother gave me permission to tell this story because she's very proud of it. Um, <laughs> he's another little four-year-old boy, and while I was watching the children one particular Sunday, he happened to have a collision with a little girl, and they just bumped into him, but the interesting thing about it is she's crying. He had no idea what he did. Sounds like my husband. I, <sighs> it's like, what? <laughs> you, Jonah, you are just like my husband. I have to tell him what he does, too. Um, so I came over and said, honey, did you know that you, you knocked into this little girl? No, I didn't know. So, said, well, uh, we need to do something about this. Do you look in her face. Does she look happy to you? And he's like, no. She was crying and sniffling, and he hurt me, and he knocked into me. And so I said, well, what are we going to do? And he looks at her without me saying anything, and he says, Amy, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, so I said, well, that's a great place to start. Saying sorry is really important, but we need to do more than that. We need to ask her if there's anything that we can do to make her feel better. Maybe we can bring her a little cup of water. Maybe we can get a wet paper towel and have her wipe her tears with it. Maybe that would feel good for her. Let's see how we can make Amy feel better. <laughs> so he turns to Amy. Oh, how things can change when you're missing one word. He says to Amy, Amy, is there anything I can do to feel you better? <laughs> and, hmm, um, <laughs> he ended up getting her a cup of water. And it was a, a really cute story, and his mother loved it. That's my boy. Uh, but the point of that is, is that we do that a lot, too. How many times does God try to bump into us and we ignore it or don't even know it's happening? <sighs> I know for me, it's a lot. And if I would notice and be with and be present for God in that way, <sighs> I know that I will always be present and the point of this story and me telling you is, is not how can I feel you better? How can I feel God better? And to me, that's a call to spiritual practice. It's a call to go inside and say, you know, God, you are, you are my beloved. You are my love. You are my guidance, my, my intuition, my inspiration. All those beautiful God qualities that we talk about, they're not out here. The children know that they're in here. They know. They get it. They don't live long enough yet to learn otherwise, like many of us have. So there's a quote from Ernest Holmes I would like to share with you about children. We must become as little children. How we long for a return of that simple trust in life which children have. In their minds, there's no doubt they have not yet been told that they are destitute of divine guidance in spiritual life. The life of a child is lived in natural goodness. God is natural goodness. The prison walls of false experience soon build themselves into barriers shutting out the light. And the child grows into a man, often losing his sense of that inner guide, leading his footsteps aright. <sighs> The consciousness of a child, good and plenty. I am sure we all know children who know that they can have what they want. There's just, babies come into the world immediately getting their needs met, right? Uh, and that is very strong up in a point of time in child development where we start uh, understanding that there's other things going around than just our desires. But I want to go to that time, that time where children are so intentional and so, uh, so strong in there, uh, I'm going to have that. And I'd like to introduce you to a family that lives next door to me. They're an amazing family. The kids are just brilliant. Uh, the first person we met of our neighbors was their dog. They have a little white boxer named Hiccup. 
and Hiccup would just show up at our door. He'd be there, doo doo doo, just tilting his head in our, our stained glass window where we can just see his cute little face. Like, who is that? Let him in. He loves my two labs. They play, they run, they just. It, we have become so close that we co parent. We have uh, shared custody of Hiccup. He sleeps with us. We, you know, we just love him so much. Well, we met him before anybody else. Next thing you know, a uh, little girl comes over. Her name is Kendall. And this little girl taught me a lot about consciousness. Kendall uh, rang the doorbell with her two accomplices. She has older brothers. They rang the doorbell. And I opened the doorbell. And I opened the door and saw these three beautiful children there. I'm like, hi. And they were holding flowers. And I was thinking, how sweet. They're bringing me flowers to get Hiccup back home. No. We have some flowers. Do you want to buy some? Sure. Absolutely. I'll go get you some money. And, you know, I came back and gave him a couple dollars each for these beautiful flowers. Said it was nice to meet you. Are you Hiccup's family? Yes. Oh, good. So we'll see a lot of each other. We love Hiccup. So I closed the door, went to the bedroom, and said to my husband, Honey, I think we just bought some of our very own flowers. <laughs> they picked our flowers, came to the door, and sold them to us. And this was only the beginning. <laughs> only the beginning. Oh my gosh, next thing you know, our fruit is going right and left. The lemons are off and they're having lemonade stands. Like, I go there and buy it, it's brilliant. Until they wanted three fifty dollars for a little pixie cup of lemonade. Um, what else, oh my gosh. Um, they, they had an art sale one day, we were walking down the street and they, they scribbled color crayon on the rocks. And uh, so we, we walked over to him, and we found one that we were, like, interested in. And, and my husband, Matt, says, how much is that one? And Kendall, with her consciousness, says to us, $100. We're like, whoa, we hope you get that. And we kept walking down the street. Very, very amazing young, young lady. Um, good and plenty consciousness. And, you know, the, the last thing I'll tell you about Kendall is that she fell in love with my Christmas cookies that I make every year. And this girl loved them so much that she would just come over and ask for them. Can I have a cookie, please? That's how she said it. Can I have a cookie, please? Oh, she was so cute. Uh, always dirty, always in the dirt with her brothers. So cute. Um, so she fell in love with my Christmas cookies. And um, so... Uh, gave her cookies, and then she, I could see her wheels turning. She wanted to come back and figure out how she can get more cookies because she really liked it. It was good, and she wanted plenty more of that. So uh, click, click goes the little brain, and all of a sudden, Hiccup, who never once had difficulty finding my house, was coming over with Kendall to play. Hmm. She would bring him over, and then she'd go, can I have a cookie, please? Of course you can. Then all of a sudden, she'd be bringing over my mail. She'd bring in the mail, ring the doorbell. Here's your mail. Did you want a cookie, honey? Yes. I really want a cookie, and I need one for my cousin, and I need one for my sister, and I need one for my two brothers, and I need one for my auntie who's over. There was nothing stopping this girl from getting what she wanted. And, and I think that is so brilliant. And I, I didn't get upset at the fact that she was taking my things and selling them to me. Isn't that what we all do here in God's world? It's, every one of us does that somewhere. Are we going to get mad about that? No, I applaud the brilliance. I applaud the creativity. I applaud the, the innovative thinking that these kids are going to grow up and be just amazing in whatever they choose to do, provided they find a science of mind church right away and, <laughs> and don't grow old enough to forget. <laughs> It's so interesting, you know, my, my daughter, my youngest daughter is, is getting ready to go away to college. And when she went into high school, speaking about science of mind and kids, um, this is my proud moment because when she, she went to a Catholic high school and she had to get interviewed, uh, that's a whole other talk, but she had to get interviewed to, um, by the headmaster to go to be accepted in the school. And here she is, a freshman, uh, embarrassed and awkward and, and uncomfortable, and she's having this one-on-one -on -one with the headmaster. And she asked me prior to that, um, what am I going to say when they, they ask what religion am I? And I said, honey, are you Catholic? She said, no. So I said, well, what are you going to put down then? Who are you? And she put down science of mind. So the headmaster looks at this application and says, what is this? 
this mind of science. And my daughter looked her right in the eye and said, it's where we see God in all people. That's what it is. And it said, science of mind. Oh, the pride. Mm, the joy in, in her knowing who she is and being in a Catholic school for four years. Uh, and she's, she's really solid in, in who she is. So it was really, really a wonderful thing for her. <sighs> so what do we do when we're not feeling in the good and plenty consciousness? How can we get back there? What does that mean for us? Where, where can we go with that? Well, when we're in a challenge or a struggle or a lack of consciousness, whatever it is, I think the important thing to do is to move through it. I know for me that I make this motion that it, that it comes in me, through me, and out. It doesn't come this way. It, comes, it goes this way. So out of me comes seeing past whatever that is. Uh, seeing from the end like children do, I just have to have that. Figuring out how is not as important as knowing what I want. I see past the challenge, move through it, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving until I am actually where I see myself to be in the desired place and turn away from the undesired place. And it's... Uh, I also sometimes think about an airport. It's an analogy for me that when I'm stuck in something I don't want, I take off, just like we do in an airplane. Take off, what happens next? We cruise in high altitude with a higher view of whatever was going on down here. And when we cruise at that higher view, we get all kinds of inspiration and all kinds of guidance and all kinds of, come on, let's do this together. And then we land in a new place. No one goes to the airport to not go anywhere. I go to my inner airport when I need to land in a new place. The, one of my favorite bumper stickers I've ever seen is when you're going through hell, keep going. Nobody's asking us to stay there, right? <laughs> so we get back as quick as we can. Get back as quick as we can because in that good and plenty consciousness, we know that there isn't anything to keep us from what we want just like Kendall. Nothing to keep us from what we want. And I have one more quote that I would like to share with you from my heart to yours. As Rumi says, the sky can only be reached through the heart. So please know that God is always in your pocket. Please do your work to feel God better and to know that because of you, I got to touch the sky today. Thank you so much. And so it is.